Hi, Christ community. We are glad that you are joining us today. I want to remind you that we do have indoor services going on. Uh, they are at 9 and 1045, and you can register on Thursday every week for the upcoming Sunday service. But if you're joining us online, we are thrilled that you are here. If you are joining us for the first time, or maybe this is one of the first times that you've been watching us, we want you to go to our website and fill out our connect card so that we can know that you're watching and we can reach out and connect with you and help you learn a little bit more about our church. The other thing I wanna make sure that you know is that as a staff, we pray for you every week. So if you go to our Leewood homepage and fill out the prayer request card, we can be praying specifically for the things that are on your mind. Finally, we believe that our God is an amazingly generous God. And if you want to continue to contribute to the mission of Christ's community, you can go online or you can drop your check off at the multi-site office or mail it there, and you can contribute to our mission in those ways. One thing that I want you to be aware of is that our golf outing is happening on August 8th. This is an annual event and it is a lot of fun. All you need to do is go to our website, check out all the details and register with three, or three of your friends and you can have a great day of golf on August 8th. Thanks for being here. Now, listen to uh, this moment from our children's ministry as we hear from God's word. This is a BTNN breaking news story. God's son changes everything. This is Eric Jones with the Bible Times News Network. We've been tracking the developments around the temple in Jerusalem after the return of Jesus to heaven. As we have reported, many Jews began to believe in Jesus Christ and the word is spreading to new communities that Jesus is alive. Jewish leaders tried to stop the new believers from spreading the good news, namely, Jesus is God, that He rose from the dead, defeated sin and death, that He sent the Holy Spirit to live inside of us, and that everyone can become Christ's child. It has been declared among this community that God's Son has changed everything. But newly developing today and continuing to develop is now our top story. Saul, a Jewish leader who was well known for rounding up Jesus followers and bringing them to Jerusalem for trial and even killing followers of the way for saying that Jesus was God, has himself experienced an amazing change of heart. Some aren't surprised because they believe, as one observer put it, that God's Son changes everything. Several days ago, Saul traveled to Damascus to capture believers and was struck blind. One eyewitness said, suddenly, a light from heaven flashed around. It was so bright, everyone had to look away. When the light went away, Saul was on the ground and he could not see. What is truly amazing is Saul's own testimony as to what happened. Saul told BTNN, Jesus spoke to me. He told me to stop persecuting him. He told me he was God. And then he said he went blind. Saul continued with his testimony. Everything I had seen and known before was gone in the flash of a bright light. Everything in my life has been turned upside down. Jesus is God, and now that I know, it has changed everything. But Saul remained blind. Sources close to the situation told BTNN that three days later, God used a man named Ananias, a believer himself, to return Saul's eyesight. Ananias states that he was fearful since Saul had been a dangerous man. But Ananias went to Saul. When he laid his hands on Saul's eyes, it said that something like scales fell from his eyes and he could see again. Then Saul got up and was baptized. It's now coming into the newsroom that Saul was so changed by Jesus that he changed his name to Paul and is fearlessly and effectively declaring the truths of the gospel. The only explanation that those who have seen this can offer is that God's Son changes everything. Stay tuned for more late breaking developments. Now back to your regularly scheduled program. Hear these words from Psalm 95 as our call to worship today. Well, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. 
Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. Father, I can see that you were drawing a line in the sand And I want to be standing on your side, holding your hand So let your kingdom come, let it live in me This is my prayer, this is my plea Let the worshippers arise Let the sons and the daughters see I'm surrendering my all I surrender to the King Father, I hear it growing louder The song of your redeemed As the saints of every name are awakening to sing from our hearts there comes an anthem we'll oh, hear the heavens ring this is our song a song to our king let the worshipers arise let the sons and the daughters sing I'm surrendering surrender to the King. Let the worshipers arise. Let the sons and the daughters sing. I'm surrendering my own. I surrender to together. Father, we gather as your people, those who have gathered in your name, near and far, as a reflection of the lives we surrender to your will and to your ways. We come 
to this place in this time to pause as we tell of your wonders, reminding one another of all that you have done and all that you're doing. And we proclaim your great love for us, giving thanks and praise to the one who alone is worthy of our attention and our awe. In our time of worship today, may we rightly give you the honor that you deserve. May our songs and prayers point all people to you and to you alone. May we read your word with reverence. May we hunger for its words of life. May our eyes and ears be open to all that you have in store for us. And may we receive what you have to say with humility and intention that we may, that we may emerge from this moment with hearts full to share your hope in the spaces that you have called us and with those you have placed in our lives. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 33. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife, and children, and brothers, and sisters, and yes, even his own life. He cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and cannot finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So my wife, Rebecca, and I did what you're never supposed to do. Uh, and we spent over an hour with a solicitor in our neighborhood selling security equipment. And, you know, it's just one of those things that I look back on and I, and I wonder why. But in, in the midst of, of talking with this very nice gentleman about this security system that he was, that he was offering and the, and the special deal, right, that we could get, if only we signed up right now. In the midst of that, I was listening and you know, I thought, this, is, this does sound like a pretty good deal and I would love an upgrade or whatever it was that I was justifying myself. And so we were in the process of actually like putting a contract together and I pulled up my phone and I actually looked at the invoice. So not just what was being said, but what was written down. And I realized that all of the costs were hidden in this huge monthly fee with a commitment for like five years. And it became immediately apparent to me that after wasting an hour of my life and, and this person's life, that I could not afford this. There's no way. It was super awkward. I had to say that uh, to the salesman and I thought, now he hates me and he tried to sweeten the deal and he like called his manager. We had to talk to the manager. Even though we knew this wasn't gonna happen, my wife and I were too nice to just kind of stop and move on. So we, we, we prolonged the pain. But eventually, it was just absolutely crystal clear to everyone there. We were not able to do this. There's just no way. I bring that up because there's a sense in which Jesus is asking us this very question in this parable. He's asking, are you able to follow me? I know you're willing and you probably want to follow me, but are you able to? Can you afford to follow me? Because the cost of following Jesus is high. Now, perhaps... Uh, many of us come into this parable, this conversation, thinking, well, of course I want to follow Jesus because grace is, is free, right? And that's true. We, there's nothing we can do to earn Jesus' love and forgiveness. That's absolutely true. Grace is free in that sense. But Jesus reminds us here in this parable that to follow him will cost us everything. It will cost us everything. We will spend a lifetime following him learning to surrender more and more of ourselves if we are doing it right. It's what it looks like to follow him truly. 
So Jesus' parable here is about counting the cost ahead of time, which is a really intuitive part of many of our lives, right? That's why Jesus gives the parable the way that he does. He basically says, you know, before you follow me, uh, imagine a builder starting a project. Would they begin the project without first counting the cost, making sure they have the necessary materials and the necessary funds to actually complete the project? Because how embarrassing and terrible it would be if they would start the project and be unable to finish it. We, we bring that reasoning into all parts of our lives. Actually, as a church right now, it's really tangible. We've started two building projects, if you remember, a permanent home for our Shawnee campus and our downtown campus. And before we began that project, we put a plan together and voted on it. Why? Because it would be dumb not to. This is Jesus' point. You look ahead and make sure you're able to do what will be required of you before you begin. He says, if you want to follow me, have you really considered the cost? Jesus is not interested in buried fees and uh, hidden contracts. He's not, that's not, he's very upfront about what it means to follow him. And the context of this parable, if you remember, it's in Luke 14. If you have your Bible with you, turn there now. It starts with, now great crowds accompanied him and he turned to them and said, so he's got all of these, his popularity is growing. He's got all these people following him. And then he gives this parable about counting the cost. And I think what he's concerned about is that the people who are following him have unconsciously buried the costs that they don't want to consider as they begin their relationship with him as Lord. And he he wonders, when the test comes, are you going to fail? Are you ready? And most of us are probably who are watching are following Jesus right now, or at least interested in doing that, but perhaps payment hasn't yet come due in our lives. And Jesus is asking us, have you considered the cost? Have you prepared for the cost to come of what it means to follow me? Because it will cost you something. That's Jesus' intent here with this parable. So what I want to spend our time considering is what costs have we failed to consider when Jesus gives this parable? What, What costs have we failed to consider? Uh, The point of the parable is really straightforward. Have you counted the cost? But what have we maybe not consciously brought to mind and thought, yes, that this could cost me this X to follow Jesus? And the first thing that Jesus hints at here as he describes the cost of discipleship uh, is what I'm calling the cost of loyalty. There's a loyalty cost. And you really see this uh, before the parable in Luke. uh, It's Luke uh, 14. Uh, 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, he cannot be my disciple. These are really shocking words from Jesus at this time. But Jesus says there are all kinds of loyalties in life and many of them to family members that may come into competition with your loyalty to me. Now keep in mind, uh, in the in the Hebrew mindset, uh, this language of hate is not about emotively hating the people in your life. Uh, it is, a, it is a, an exaggeration, a metaphor for commitment. Are you more committed to me than to these other loyalties and even your family members in your life? And Jesus is very concerned about divided loyalties pulling us away from him. That's his point here. He says your, your loyalties cannot be divided. They must be properly ordered. Your loyalty to me must inform every other loyalty in your life, and it must come first, and everything else has to become secondary. So his first example here is loyalty to family. I just read that passage. And many of us maybe haven't uh, had to feel the pinch of the, the, uh, the dissonance between our faith and our loyalty to Jesus and our family. Uh, but many people uh, have experienced this. I'm thinking now in particular of those of you who have become Christian, your parents have not. Those of you who are married and you want to be a follower of Jesus Jesus and your spouse doesn't. Uh, Or even kind of in a a more general way, there are times where we make decisions as individuals and families that impact our families or our friends, our key relationships. And Jesus is asking us to do something that these other people in our lives don't want us to do or don't feel comfortable with. Even as simple as reading your Bible or going to church, they don't want you to do that. Jesus is hinting there may be conflict in your life around family. Now, in other cultures, including this one, this would have been an incredibly scandalous thing for Jesus to say because loyalty to family is so primary. And you even think around the world today. I've talked to many Asian brothers and sisters in the Lord where this is a really hard issue for them. 
because their parents disapprove uh, of their relationship with Jesus. Uh, and obviously, in many cultures, your loyalty to your parents is really, really important. And Jesus knew this. He said, you've got to watch out for your loyalty to family. But perhaps what I feel more acutely uh, today not, is not necessarily our loyalty to family, but our loyalty to politics. And you guys, just let's just be honest. We're entering a season where people are on TV and on the internet asking for our loyalty. And that's only going to increase as, as the months go on here in 2020. And as followers of Jesus, it has become easier than ever, I think, to choose politics and cable news and the internet over Scripture and Jesus. But our loyalties become divided. And of course, we live in a polarized world, that mean, which means that it's, in one sense, it's harder to stay truly committed to Jesus and his kingdom. But in other ways, it becomes even more important that we stand out in our loyalties as followers of Jesus. We can really show a different way. And uh, this is nothing new, frankly. This is just as true today as it was in the ancient uh, Christian church of the first century. And Tim Keller, who is a retired pastor in New York, he, he recently gave a lecture uh, at a seminary it's really, really good uh, lectures at Princeton. Uh, uh, he got an award as a, from the Leslie Newbegin Center at Princeton. And he talked about how early Christians, their allegiance to Jesus and not the empire, made them look very different from the surrounding culture, uh, the Greco-Roman world. Not only because of their monotheism and their faith in Jesus, that was true, but also in their commitment to kingdom justice and values that were based on Scripture, and not the Greco-Roman culture. And he uh, was getting a lot of this from a scholar named Larry Hurtado who wrote a book called Destroyer of the Gods, uh, which is about the early Christian movement and the impact that it had on the Roman Empire. And I'm going to try to do this quickly, but Larry Hurtado talks about five commitments of the early church um, that were radically different from the Greco-Roman world that made them stand out in their allegiance to Jesus. Um, the first was they were known for a radical commitment to the poor and the marginalized. Uh, in fact, it was so radical that Emperor Julian, who wrote against the Galileans, which was his term for Christians, the emperor himself, this is in the fourth century, he famously said about Christians, you know, the real problem with these Christians is that they become so popular because they care not only for their own poor, but for ours as well. That was their reputation. Radical commitment to the good of the materially poor and the marginalized. Uh, they also had a radical commitment to a multi-ethnic religious identity, unlike the ancient world had ever seen. They had a religion that brought people together of all ethnicities in a way that ancient religions simply did not do. The reality in the ancient world was you could generally look at someone and just by looking at how they dress and how, what language they speak, you could say, this is what they believe. They worship this God, they, they, they read this scripture until Christians came on the scene. Then you would look at someone who was a part of a house church and you'd say, what are the, all of these people doing together? There's no explanation for why they are in a religious community together other than their loyalty to Jesus. So it was an incredible multi-ethnic religious identity in the early church. The third was a commitment to positive pro-life, what we would call pro-life, or commitment to uh, infants and their good. Uh, there was rampant infanticide in the Roman world. Uh, you, abortions were dangerous uh, and risky and expensive. And so most people didn't do them. You would have your child and if you didn't want them, you would, ex you would put them outside, you'd expose them and either someone would come get them and make them a slave or they would uh, eventually die outside alone, which is horrible to think about. Christians were known for finding these children, adopting them, bringing them into their homes and raising them as their own. So they had a commitment, a positive commitment to pro-life. The fourth uh, was uh, their sexual ethic which was much stricter than their Greco-Roman neighbors. Christians were committed to sexual relationships being by God's design between one man and one woman in a covenant of marriage. This was not the Greco-Roman idea of sexuality. Uh, marriage was about legal heirs, and especially if you were a man, whoever you slept with, that was totally fine. Um, that was not the Christian way of looking at, at sexuality. And then last, uh, was a commitment to non-retaliation, to love their enemies, as Jesus taught. So in other words, if you burned down their homes, if you took away their business, if you put them in jail, if you killed Christians in the first century, they did not do the same back to you. 
So Tim Keller, he ran through all of these things, and they are still so relevant today. And he made a point here that I want to just share about our loyalty. He said, two of these values look like one of our political parties, okay? Commitment to uh, ethnic diversity uh, and a commitment to help the poor and the marginalized. He said, this looks like the Democratic Party. He said, two others look more like the Republican Party, right? A strict sexual ethic, family values, uh, and a commitment to, uh, to life, uh, to pro-life, all stages of life. He said, two look like one, two look like the other. And he said, the fifth one, loving your enemies, doesn't really look like anybody right now. And he said, we need to be about all. We need to be category busters in our loyalty to Jesus, that we are more loyal to him and his kingdom agenda than to any political party or personality. We should look like neither of these two, was his point. Our loyalty to Jesus should make us look different. Now, I bring this up because I'm afraid and I'm praying right now that our faith, just as a Christian faith in the United States right now, I wonder if we are more famous for our political loyalties than our zeal for Jesus and his kingdom. And that should not be. Let us be zealous for Jesus and his kingdom as the early church was and known for that more than our politics, right? Our our loyalty should be clear that it's to Jesus first and everything else second. And that will cost us. There's no doubt about it in my mind. People hated the early Christians for these five commitments. They were hated. Truly, we will be hated too. And we have to reckon with that cost. And Jesus is warning us, are you ready for that? Are you prepared for that? So there's a cost to our loyalties that Jesus points out here, he illustrates here. There's also a cost of what I'm calling to our preferences, a cost of preference. And you really see this when when Jesus says, anyone who does not hate his own life cannot be my disciple. And now for many of Christians around the world, this is a literal cost to despise one's life uh, so much that you would rather die than renounce Jesus, right? That's the idea. The persecuted church all over the world daily has to make this choice, okay? But for most of us right now, this is not a real, that's not the issue for us. For for us, which is hard as well, is just the day-to-day dying to self that Jesus illustrates here. Are you prepared to die to self and follow me. And in so many ways, you guys, it has never been easier to live your life and avoid the cost of discipleship. It is so easy to go church shopping and find a place that agrees with everything you already think about the world and to never be challenged by it, to avoid real community that might make you uncomfortable by numbing ourselves with endless distractions instead of partnering with God in our own personal and spiritual maturity. You have so many options and distractions, it's never been easier to do this. So ask yourself this week, are you ready to let go of your preferences to follow Jesus wherever he may take you? And are there things in your life now where your obedience costs you something? Because it should. Our loyalty and obedience to Jesus should cost us something. Our time should look different. Our comfort should look different. Our resources should look different. If we look like everybody around us, except we go to church or watch church for an hour on Sunday, we we haven't taken this call to to denying oneself seriously enough. And Jesus is warning us, you've got to be able to do that if you're truly going to follow me. Now, I buried the lead here a little bit. So Jesus gives us a couple illustrations of what it might cost us to follow him. And I wanted to talk about that. But Jesus actually asks us one more question before we're done. And uh, after he's gone over all the hidden costs and, 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 or all the costs that we might hide in following Jesus, we still must ask this question, can we afford not to follow Jesus? And you really see this in, in Jesus' second parable. He says, uh, who among you would build without being prepared? And then he says, what king would go to war with another king who has twice the army, twice the power that he does without preparing to surrender if necessary, right? He says, if If a king goes to war with another and realizes, I'm going to lose, he says, offer peace. Offer terms of surrender, okay? That's the idea. It's like, if you're going to lose the war, go and surrender to the king before he gets to you. That would be better. And Jesus is hinting here, I think, and many scholars agree, that what he's saying is that even though the cost of surrender may be high, and he talked a little bit about that, the cost of defeat is even higher In other words, Jesus is saying, I am the king and I am coming into your life. I am invading your space, whether you're ready for me or not. 
And you need to examine yourself because you have two options when I come into your life. You can fight me, and we all know how that'll go, or you can surrender to me. In other words, Jesus is saying, now, you know, if you think disappointing your children or your wife or your husband or your in-laws is bad, try disappointing me. If you think being on the wrong political side is bad, try being on the wrong side of my kingdom. The cost of defeat is higher than the cost of surrender. So here's the thing. Jesus says, you've got to surrender to me. It will be much better for you if you do that. But he, he says here, offer terms of surrender. So what are Jesus' terms of surrender? And I want, to, I want to end with this. There's nothing Jesus demands of us, even in our cost of loyalty here, that he does not return to you tenfold. These are his terms of surrender. He says, if you give your life to me and your loyalty to me, your allegiance to me, yes, it will change your family, potentially. But you will get a new family in return, a family of God. This is why Jesus, when he's confronted by his biological family to stop ministering, he says, behold my mother and my brothers. And these, it was his followers. This is a new family I've created. Yes, it changes your status in the world. But you are given a new status, sons and daughters of God. Yes, it may cost you your very self. It will cost you your very self. But you are given a new self. You're given an incorruptible life and a new heart. And Jesus, notice with me, He has counted the cost. He has considered you and I worth it all to him. Every sacrifice, every blow to his back, each nail in his hand, even the father turning his face away on the cross, he considered it all and said, yes, you and I, as a part of his family, is worth all of it and more. He counted the cost and said yes. And for Jesus, he says, the war has already begun. I'm coming into the world. I'm building a temple. I'm building a church. Come hell or high water. And yes, the cost is high, Jesus says. But Jesus is all in. He's all in. And the question for us is, are we? You took up your cross. For the joy set before you And now with my life Lord, I adore you For all that you are And all you have given Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come. I surrender my life to your blood. I surrender my name for your glory. I surrender my heart to your will. I surrender my dreams to the plans you have for me. Thank you for showing me the emptiness of all I held on to. I surrender it all. I surrender my everything for you. took up your cross for the joy set before you and now with my life Lord I adore you for all that you are and all you have given Jesus I come Jesus I come I surrender my life to your blood I 
surrender my name for your glory. I surrender my heart to your will. I surrender my dreams to the plans you have for me. Thank you for showing me the emptiness of all I held on to. I surrender it all. I surrender my everything for you. Thank you for showing me the emptiness of all I've held on to. I surrender it all. I surrender. surrender it all I surrender my everything for you Thank you for showing me the emptiness of all I held on to. I surrender it all. I surrender my everything for you. Hey, church family. Uh, it's me, Andrew, here with one of our uh, members of Christ Community. Her name is Brooke Hepner. She is a licensed marriage and family therapist. She's one of uh, many in our church family who serve in the vocation of counseling and therapy. And we wanted to do a little interview about how God has equipped and called her to do that work. Uh, in particular, kind of in this moment we find ourselves in, in the middle of a pandemic and a quarantine, and, and there's a lot going on, and it's, it's really kind of hit Brooke, uh, Brooke's work in a unique way, and I want, I want to hear from her, and hopefully you guys do too. Uh, so Brooke, uh, tell us a little bit about how you're experiencing brokenness mm -hmm. in your work right now. Yeah. Um, well, I particularly specialize in trauma work. Um, so that's basically kind of what I've done through most of my career. And um, so I think what I, I would say is that um, there's a lot of people experiencing trauma right now. Um, and, you know, before kind of COVID hit and just even the events with that, um, you know, that was kind of the steady stream of people that I would see that you know, experience different types of trauma, whether it was kind of a car accident or different types of abuse or um, relational difficulties. Um, what I would say though, is I've seen a really kind of large uptick in um, people reaching out over the last few months. Um, I think even sometimes these experiences of this isolation mm. and really challenging. Uh, I think what's also unique about this time is um, before kind of all this happened, right, we all had kind of a, a rhythm and a routine to our lives, maybe not a lot of slowing down or thinking about some of these kind of harder things that maybe we've experienced or having to deal with. And I think what's been kind of unique about uh, what has happened in our world is uh, it's kind of forced us to stop um, and forced us to sometimes sit with some of these feelings, these experiences, even maybe our own experience of frailty or vulnerability um, or having needs. Um, and so I think what I have seen is that even people that have had kind of traumatic experiences before this event um, are in a maybe more of a hypervigilant state right now. And what I mean by that is that there's more triggers, there's maybe more anxiety, um, there's more kind of relational difficulties, um, even kind of our body, right? We can feel maybe more chronic fatigue or pain or, um, right, just the stress of the kind of not knowing. And so I think... 
I've seen a lot of um, brokenness with that, that people are struggling. People are needing um, contact. They're needing some support. They're needing care. And I think for some people, it's maybe easier to kind of reach out for that. And for others, it's harder. Okay. So tell us a little bit, how are you experiencing rest? You have one of those jobs where you could literally probably fill your calendar every hour of every day. So how are you, how are you resting and uh, leaning into the a discipline of rest uh, in your life right now? So I have two little boys. Um, so sometimes they produce rest, right? Sometimes. They <laughs> um, but I, it's been such a gift um, to be outside, to play. Actually, that is not always something that I just naturally gravitate towards. Fortunately, my husband is better at that. Um, but to be outside and to play and to um, enjoy the little things has been really restful for me. Um, and honestly, going to bed a lot earlier, like it sounds kind of like a silly thing. No, it doesn't. But, right. But I have really had to take that more seriously. I've had to make that more of a priority. Um, and I think too, what's even been unique for me is realizing, man, if I just focus on my capacity alone, I'm not going to be able to show up in the way that I need. And so I've also tried to slow down and notice, God, how are you using this platform? How are you helping me to even trust in you that there's maybe moments and days where I feel more fatigue and just asking, um, he gives me what I need so I can show up because that's ultimately right. What I want to do. I want to create a safe space for people to kind of, um, just have space to process what's happening and deal with these things. So I think um, those have all been really important things. That's a really good, Brooke. Okay, last question. How can we be praying for you specifically as a church? So, you know, I, um, I, I like to go on prayer walks. And um, a lot of times when I do that, I use that as even time to kind of pray for some of my clients that are not believers. Um, and I feel like there's this really, again, unique, beautiful moment of, we're all feeling um, our, our vulnerability in a different kind of way. And I just keep praying over and over, God, will you use this, right? Will you speak to people um, that maybe when there's been a lot of noise, maybe there isn't as much noise. How do you allow your voice to be more clear? So I, I'm always um, praying, you know, I try to pray for my clients, but even um, I, I really just constantly am praying and asking for wisdom and discernment that, that I love the idea, right? That like God is the best in this industry, right? Like he's going to do it better than anybody else. And so how do I ask him for guidance and wisdom in this um, and ask him to show up and lead? Um, and so I think that that feels particularly important. And I think, um, and honestly, just energy, I think energy just to show up well, take care of myself um, so that I can be present in the different areas that I'm serving. Brooke, we're so grateful that you are in our church family and for the work that you do. Uh, and let me just say a word to, to any and all in your vocation who may even be watching that your work, it truly matters. And we are grateful for you. Uh, and may God bless the work of your hands. Thank you for your time, Brooke. Thanks. So thank you so much for joining us today. We really hope that this worship service has been meaningful encouragement to you. Let's pray before I release you with a benediction. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. May we follow him fully, that we be his apprentice in all things. Give us the power and strength and the hope and encouragement to follow him this week in every dimension of our life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now for the benediction, I'd like you to raise your hand as I dismiss you with the words from the Apostle Paul in Galatians 2.20. Paul writes these words, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live now in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. May the Lord's peace be with you.